This is an irreverent podcast. Check out irreverent.fm for shows from all our friends. Hello and welcome to Exvangelical, a show exploring the world inside and outside the evangelical subculture. I'm your host, Blake Chastain. Today's guest is Christina Madelone. She is a longtime friend of mine that I met in high school. We attended the same youth group in college, so we talk a lot about that. We also talk about her experiences as a missionary and pastor. Christina has a true heart for people and loves them sincerely, and I think that really comes through in her story. It's another great story that I'm honored to share with you. We also recorded this the day after the election, so you'll hear us processing that together at the end of the show. I also want to take this moment early in the year to reiterate the purpose of this show. Last week on Twitter, I put out a call for people who were once evangelical and are now agnostic, atheist, or have no affiliation to contact the show. I want to share those stories as well. Christina's story is one of faith and belief, and that has validity. But so do stories of people who have changed their beliefs, who no longer believe, or are somewhere else along the spectrum. Evangelicalism is highly cultural. It provides a cultural shorthand that makes conversation easy. The show is called Exvangelical to simply denote a person no longer identifying with evangelicalism. All other particulars are filled out by the person's story. And each story has value, perspective, and worth. So please, contact me if you want to share yours. I'm on Twitter at Pierre Chastain, and the show is on Twitter at Pod with DMs open. You can also contact the show via email at contact at exvangelicalpodcast.com. This show is for everyone. So if you know someone that's religiously di- disaffected in some way by Christianity, they'll probably find something they'll like right here. As always, you can report support the show by rating and reviewing it on iTunes or by supporting it via Patreon at patreon.com slash exvangelicalpod. All right, let's get into it. All right. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Exvangelical. This week I have with me um, one of my oldest friends, my friend Christina. She is uh, she she and I went to youth group in high school together, and then we also went to the unnamed Christian college together. Um, welcome to the show, Christina. Thanks, Blake. <laughs> Thanks for joining me. So um, let's just dive right into it. Um, we met we met in. Um, in Illinois, in the suburb of Naperville. I don't think I'm giving away anything really there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, I believe you 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 live there. That's where you were born, right? Born and raised yeah. in, in Naperville? Edwards Hospital. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So um, we met in high school, but I'm not... I I always kind of piece together uh, a lot of your... Uh, like middle school and pre high school days, just in stories from. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so what was uh, w- what was that like, and uh, just sort of like your your family and social life and and everything leading up to uh, high school when we started to get to know each other. Yeah. Um. So I come from um, a kind of large, but also not as big as most Italian families. Um, Italian on both sides and. Um, so my parents grew up in the city. They grew up on the North side, um, going to Wrigley constantly, which I'm so jealous of. And also (laughs) we didn't talk about how the Cubs won the world series, but (laughs) we'll get there. We we will. (laughs) Um, (laughs) yeah. So they grew up in the city and when they had kids, they decided that they wanted to do better for their kids than they had had. And so they chose to move us to Naperville, though I'm not sure they could totally, um, you know, afford that lifestyle and they worked their butts off. And so, um, for the first probably, I don't know, five years of my life, we lived on the North side of Naperville and had we stayed there, I would have gone to, I think Naperville North high school. Mm. Um, and then they moved us to Crest Hill, which is somehow near Joliet. Um, I don't remember why, to be honest, I have a feeling it had something to do with finances. Um, And so we were in that area for about three years. And then the Plainfield tornado came through and like destroyed everything. Uh, And then we moved back to Naperville 
uh, when I was in fourth grade and um, in Ash, you know, in Ashbury. And that's kind of where most of my memories are. Uh-huh. Although yeah. I do not have that many memories from my childhood. Um, yeah. So grew up, uh, in my opinion, very privileged and um, pretty close family. Grew up Catholic. Both of my parents. Uh, my dad, I remember talking a lot about going to Catholic school, and he went to an all boys high school, Lane Tech, which I think is still um, going on. It's like still, yeah, yeah, Lane Tech is it, still around. Yeah, but it's not an all boys school anymore. Yeah, I don't think it, um, it is now. Yeah, so I was baptized Catholic. I did my first communion in the Catholic Church, and um, my parents were even CCD teachers, uh, and then. Right around the time I was like 12 or so, my mom's mom passed away. And it was when that happened that my parents kind of stepped away from the Catholic Church and were, we never talked about it as a family. It was one of those things where like, okay, great. We don't have to spend our Saturday night or Sunday morning at church. This is awesome. Because I can remember my brother and sister and I uh, running around the church you know, obviously in the hallway or whatever, and like having competitions pretty much to see how many times we could go to the bathroom so that we would not have to be in church. Like it was, <laughs> how how much can we do this before mom and dad are like, sit your ass down? <laughs> you know? um, so yeah, needless to say, I did not um, really love going to mass. Now, when I look back on that, I'm like, what a fool, because there's so much to be revered from that tradition. And, um, but that's okay. Uh, so when they stopped going to church, it seemed like a win. Um, and then uh, one night I had a sleepover with, uh, Carly, who I'm one of my best friends and her mom, her rule kind of was like, if you are staying here, we're all going to go to church in the morning. And I just thought, well, who cares? Because, Car- you know, I love Carly. And so we'll, we'll do this. So I remember going to Sunday school at Wheatland, the church that we grew up in when it was still in this tiny little building, um, on route 59. And I was like amazed, first of all, that all of my friends were there, like all of our friends from school. Mm. Um, were at Sunday school and their families and like, okay, well, this isn't so bad. And then the pastor at the time, um, was super relatable. And, uh, for the first time I felt like I understood what he was saying to me and to us. Um, and then of course we had this youth pastor, um, who was amazing and crazy (laughs) and, um, the most, I think, loving and gracious person I've ever encountered in my life. Uh, and so I, I went to a youth group a few times in the shack, um, when it was still a shack and she, Becky gave me a Bible and it was a paperback, uh, NIV Bible that I still have somewhere in my house, I think. Um, and I remember opening to Matthew and just starting to read because when I had grown up Catholic, I never, Like, I think in CCD, we looked at the Bible and I remember being super confused. Like, what are these tiny numbers for? It didn't make sense to me. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so I started reading Matthew and it came alive. Like, I remember laying in my little day bed in my room um, being like, holy crap, Jesus died for me. And changed my life. Like it shook me to my core. I don't have like a conversion moment that I could name the time and day. And so some people might even say I'm not saved. (laughs) I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, so right around like eighth grade, freshman year, I guess, probably freshman year is when I came to know Christ. And um, uh, that's pretty much where you came into our lives, <laughs> into our group of friends, into yeah. our youth group. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that, um, I, I moved to Naperville the last like six weeks of our freshman year. So I met like a handful of people and then, um, but I didn't, I didn't really know anyone that summer. And then somehow I, I, I ended up going, my family ended up going to our church because it was within walking distance from Mm -hmm. where we lived. 
Um, and it was a it was a Methodist church, and that was the denomination we went to in our old town, Crawfordsville. And then, um, yeah, and then somehow I learned, you know, I guess early into my sophomore year, I probably through choir or something else that some people I knew uh, went to youth group there, and then that kind of just I just slid right in. <laughs> Um, You're a slitherer. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh my god. Tell gosh. that story so it doesn't. Uh... <laughs> yeah, definitely. No. So we, for I the listeners, we used very, to call Blake shy. a slitherer because, like, all of a sudden he would appear and we'd be like, "Oh my gosh, Blake is here!" And then, like, you know, have a good, you know, even at the lunch table or something in high school or sitting at the lockers, and then all of a sudden Blake's not there, and so. <laughs> Like he would somehow slither away unnoticed and it was amazing, but also weird. So we decided that Blake was a slitherer and very yeah. sneaky. <laughs> and and uh, looking back, I probably had a lot of undiagnosed anxiety <laughs> and, <laughs> and shyness, which I, you know, battled to overcome over time. Um, sure. Well, so. <laughs> and being in our friend group, being in our friend group probably didn't help because I'll speak for myself, but I was and probably still am quite obnoxious. So tend to be like (laughs) over overbearing at times. And so I would be anxious if I were in our friend group too. (laughs) (laughs) No, I mean, I, um, our, our friend group definitely had its share of drama. Um, (laughs) but, uh, Uh but at the same time, it was also, it it could be, you know, it it was high school. So Mm -hmm. all the things that go into being high school, being a high school student, was mixed in with also trying to figure out like big questions about you know um about God and ourselves and what the hell all that means and um yeah. and as you pointed out our youth pastor was amazing um like she was just an amazing leader and the relationship there was still like i mean I would still be completely warm with her. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't have any, for all the things I, I diagnose and I, I talk about and I still try to process, um, that, that part of it, I, I don't really have anything <laughs> negative to say, you know, she, she, she yeah. was just a, a wonderful, she is a wonderful person. Um, mm-hmm. so, um, but yeah, so our group w- was very tight knit and very, um, very involved in the youth group. Um, like our core group was kind of like the de facto like youth leadership, I suppose. Um, you know, we were all on the youth worship team, and we started dating one another and all those different things. Um, <laughs> what was so? Uh, yeah, I mean, and I'm just. Things are, you know, rushing back or whatever. I know. But, you uh, know, I did not even remember the term slitherer until that just came up. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I don't even, like, what what sort of things are, are coming back to you besides that, that, that term for me? That <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, like you said, Becky was an amazing woman. And I'm going to name her because I don't think she cares. And I still, I, when I'm home, when I come to the Chicagoland area, I do still spend time with her. Um, she was incredible. And, and any person that walked through that door into that room or whatever, she loved them instantly. And it wasn't fake. It wasn't like an over the top. I'm going to love you because this is what I'm supposed to do. Like she genuinely loved people and absolutely. Yeah. And it didn't matter where you were coming from or what you had done or what you were still doing. She was going to love you and not be ashamed about talking, talking about Jesus with you. Like it didn't matter if you were somehow, you know, living in sin as they say or whatever, like she didn't care. She's not going to like uh, try to get you to on the spot confess and repent because she wanted to love you through that. And that was a very different experience, especially coming out of the Catholic church, like Mm, where you mm -hmm. go into a booth or you sit in a reconciliation service 
and then you're forgiven. But it was so impersonal and you weren't allowed or didn't feel like you were allowed to be connected with God. And so I guess the point is that Becky is somebody who connects people with God naturally because I think she reflects him very well. Um, so that experience completely changed how I, I mean, her and, and my relationship with her completely changed how I understood what it means to be Christ-like. Mm -hmm. And, and I always remember thinking like, I want to be like Becky when I grow up, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, she, she made it look kind of effortless. Yeah. Um, which is a testament to the, you know, just to her spirit. Um, mm -hmm. so in, in light of that though, we, I mean, even um, even though we kind of had, we, we still had like a lot of evangelical trappings, even in a mainline youth group, which was, you know, which was interesting. And I, I also think it just, I, I still try to think back even when I talk about things like this. Um, I haven't talked to anyone like you that was, you know, uh, anyone that was there with me, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. um, and since I've started this, uh, but I don't really know how to uh, make those two things compatible because we did we did have this um, this leader uh, and other leaders like um, mm -hmm. like Rich like Rich was yeah. a, Rich just devoted his time and uh, he just wanted to hang out like yeah uh, you know he just devoted his time and um, and all these other people too. Um, but there was something else going on too that was just sort of an underlying current, and I don't know who or what put that pressure on us. <laughs> like, yeah, I agree. Um, we learned Christianese, and we, you know, I, I was, um, I can't think of a word right now, but like we walked through that purity culture thing. I signed a stinking thing and had a ring that I wore and it wasn't, I think the difference is I didn't get the feeling that if I didn't do that, I was going to be looked down upon. I was going to be judged for not wearing a ring or not saying, you know, whatever. Um, and so maybe that's the difference because I do remember like getting that, I even spoke years later. Um, I don't know, this, I may, have, we may have been in college at the time. I'm not sure, uh, but they asked me to come back and speak as a single woman um, who was committed to purity. Um, again, so this was like 2004 or something like that. Um, and so that's who I represented it, that night that they had a purity talk and they had the mothers and the daughters come. And then they had, um, a guy come in and talk from his perspective. Um, so I think it was there, but I think at least I experienced it differently because of my perceived lack of judgment, you know? Yeah. And I don't know whether like just thinking back, you know, it's, it's important it might be just impossible to parse out like what was just uh, incredible teenage drama, <laughs> like <laughs> us like figuring out who we are as people while riddled with crazy hormones and, and yeah. like uh, confused thoughts about so many things. And I mean, I, mm -hmm. I also, you know, it wasn't like um, at the same time, it wasn't like it wasn't sincere. Um, right. So, you know, we had, all of us like were really devoted to kind of um, figuring out what this whole God thing was about and like being, it, doing it very earnestly. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> yeah. Well, and for me, like, sorry to interrupt. Oh no, not at all. <laughs> at that time, the church was all I had, at least in my mind, because my dad got sick when I was, uh, I want to say 11 or 12. And uh, became disabled. Um, and my parents, when I was 16, made the decision to move to Arizona. So um, I, right after our sophomore year of high school, you may have even come to my going away party. I mean, I thought that I was moving 
um, mm-hmm. to Arizona yeah. and I was devastated and begged and be- and spent that entire summer crying and begging my parents um, while I was in Arizona to let me go back. Like, how can you remove me from this place where I've lived for, you know, however many years? These are my friends. I can't leave my church, you know, and they didn't quite, I don't think, understood what the church meant to me at that time. Um, but they have always, always, always been super supportive of me and trusted me, I guess, as much as you would trust a teenager. Um, and so they let me stay. And so my entire, my sophomore year, my dad had already gone to Arizona and he, like they were having a house built and he was dealing with all that while my mom, uh, stayed up in Illinois to finish, uh, to sell our house and all that kind of stuff. So, um, when she moved and then I stayed, I, I stayed with friends of the family in Joliet or Crest Hill, which I'm pretty sure you've been down there. Yeah. And, yeah. um, <laughs> um, so for me, the church was my home. Like I, for as much as I begged to stay, there were still feelings of abandonment and, um, like I, times when I felt desperate, like we had these choir concerts and all of your parents would be there. And then I was by myself. And because my sister still lived in Illinois, but um, wasn't interested in my life at that time. So like, I really relied on the church and people like Becky to come to our choir concert, because then I wasn't going to be alone. And even though my best friend's parents were there and loving me, I still maybe it was a woe is me thing, or maybe it really was like a holy cow, I'm lonely thing. Um, but yeah, the point is that the church became like this really important piece of forming who I was and, and determining where I felt safe and where I felt comfortable. So your families, you and and our friends like became it for me in that time. And so the way I was treated then has also been, was very formative and shaped kind of how I, I think, relate to people and why I'm so, even as I live out here in New Jersey now, I live on my own, you know, my family, nobody lives here. So Mm -hmm. um, I tend to to cling to and seek relationships that are safe. Yeah. And that's, I mean, at the, at the, at the time I, you know, even if I even if I failed to verbalize it, if I even if I failed as a friend to tell you, <clears throat> like I thought what you were what you did by choosing um, by staying in Illinois um, and living with friends of the family, like that was that was courageous. Like <laughs> that was like a a level of uh, maturity and a level of independence that I don't think any of our other people in our friend group exhibited at that point in their lives and like it's like a very brave thing um and yet you know you 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 put yourself out there you you kind of just leapt into (laughs) leapt into life and uh and at a at a stage when i think a lot of people don't do that um so i know uh, yeah i i'm i know i can't even fathom how hard that was um I mean, I was always glad for you when you were able to go back and, and spend time with family and everything too. Um, but I was fortunate enough, I believe, to actually learn um, through you really about the um, the school we ended up both attending, the college we and we both ended up attending. Um, I was at the time, you know, I. Uh, I definitely, I felt like I had like a calling to be a pastor. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, you know, I had told my parents that they said they would support me in that decision. Um, and I only looked at Christian schools um, as a result of that understanding of my life at that time. Um, and yeah, through our, just kind of through our conversations, we ended up talking about our school and then I applied there and I ended up liking it. and. Uh, yeah, we both ended up going there and um I think that was great because we had we kind of had each other to lean on. <laughs> Definitely. <that> freshman <laughs> year and someone to hang out with and I walked into um 
we both kind of walked into a world that we didn't realize like would be so um interconnected already like i remember my first night in the dorm the very first night of college i met the the guy who's still my best friend um but the funny thing was that he knew like a dozen people walking into college um <laughs> yeah he's like but it's like i know christina and christina's awesome and we're gonna hang out <laughs> you know and so um so it was really uh really great um but what how, how did how did you kind of experience the first year or so at, at college and um dorm life and, and everything else i mean i know we were we were always we we saw each other probably nearly every day like mm-hmm. for small years. campus <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah and we would hang out you know we would um later and later you know in college like i'd come over to your townhouse and watch you play super mario or whatever <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> but uh but anyways. did i not invite you to play oh no no you you would invite me but it was oh. you had a um <laughs> You had a Super Nintendo, and I never, I never had Super Nintendo, so watching you was like, a, like just like watching an artist. <laughs> oh my gosh, that you, just made my day. Because <laughs> like, because you know, you you like knew everything, um, but I I never, yeah, I only had the original NES, and then several years later, I got a sixty four. Um, but I I totally skipped the SNES with the four buttons, and I didn't know yeah. what the hell I was doing. <laughs> I wish that I still had those skills. I have an original NES here. And uh, when my nieces stayed with me all summer, we played and I showed them how to beat the Mario games. And <laughs> felt like I've done, you know, that and read Harry Potter with them feel like I've done my job as an aunt. There you go. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. College. Um, I to go back a little bit um, to prior. Uh, so I only applied to two schools, that school and another one pretty local uh, to that school. And I I knew about that school from another friend who graduated from our high school a year before, um, Jonathan, if you remember. And so oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I only went there one time prior to enrolling to audition for um, a music scholarship. That was horrifying um, because I I'm not a soloist at all, but anyway, they give you a little bit of money, even if you're not great. So that's nice. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, I ended up going there pretty much just because that extra uh, little bit of money. And um, my parents were supportive, but very nervous about it because I had made them a promise that I broke uh, that if I was able to stay in high school for Uh, stay in Illinois for high school, then I would move out towards Arizona for college. And that was, that went to hell basically, because I could, (laughs) couldn't bear the thought of being that far away from my friends and family. So, um, while they were supportive, I, you know, they weren't also the cost of the school wasn't, um, exciting to them either because they knew that I would be taking out loans and, they would do what they could to help, but that I would end up in debt, which I did and I'm still paying for today. Um, so yeah, the choice to go there, uh, I, I just, it was one of those things that you just make that choice when you only apply to two schools. So, um, yeah, I applied to three, so I'm not, (laughs) yeah. Uh, Yeah. So I'm, I'm right there with you. It was a small pool. Yeah. Yeah, it was. I I just knew I didn't want to go to a state school because I felt like I would probably make bad choices and I definitely would have, um, things would look different. I I don't know, whatever. Uh, so yeah, the first year was really interesting. I don't think I knew going into it or maybe I've blocked that out that the rules would be quite as oppressive as they were. Like for someone like me, I had been independent for a few years already. Um, so to have a curfew seemed a little crazy and like, I am not 15. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't even know it. Did you know about it? Did you know about it? No, I didn't. (laughs) (laughs) Which I mean, like in the grand scheme of things, a curfew is not the end of the world or that big of a deal. And I understand the reasoning behind it. Like they're trying to help us avoid, uh, tricky situations, if you will. Um, but 
it was just the dumbest thing. I, like I was really pissed about it. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. You know, after having so much freedom and, um, yeah, so I did not enjoy that. I also hated the whole rated R movie thing and had movies anyway. And so when my RA or RD asked everyone in that first kind of initial meeting slash here are our rules, um, I didn't, I lied. Like I didn't admit that I had the movies and thought, First of all, rated R movies are okay for anyone over 17. I mean, this was my logic at 18. Yeah. And second of all, like, again, you're not going to tell me. I think maybe I was arrogant, like, <laughs> because I had been independent for so long, I felt like I didn't need to be ruled over, um, which probably wasn't true. Uh, but yeah, so so I did feel quite oppressed. And even the visiting guys and girls and feet on the floor and like so my thought even like for you if you came to my dorm room and it was freaking freezing in there if we shared a blanket that would not be a big deal to me yeah. and and yet the RA would walk past and be like oh dear god what's happening you know um so i hated that i uh, yeah things like that i did not appreciate um but one of the reasons I chose the school was because I did want to live a life that was pleasing to God. And so even if I didn't care for things like those rules, um, I understood that they were in place to foster an environment uh, where Christ was at least su supposedly <laughs> centered. Um, yeah. There were pr plenty of places around that campus where that was not the case. Um, but that's what happens when you oppress people. So, yeah, yeah, and I'm I'm right there with you. I uh, I definitely did not. Um, I I I went. I can't. I was blindsided that even like the first day. Like I didn't know about curfew. I didn't know about the rated R thing. I mean, most of my friends, including you, were pretty much scofflaws, you know, and we would. Especially the movie thing. The movie thing was so stupid. Um, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, like curfew. Um, usually just <clears throat> kind of break it. Um, occasionally break it, but also like, I remember one time freshman year, <clears throat> the guy that would become my, my roommate sophomore year, and I just walked out of our dorm at 3 a.m. <laughs> you know, in front of all, like at four RAs. <laughs> like, yeah. They were yeah. all just like hanging out in the lobby and no one, no one batted an eye really. I mean, they looked and then they looked, I don't know. It was, it was dumb and they knew it was dumb and we wanted Taco Bell. So I don't know. Right. We, maybe we offered to pick something up for them. I have no idea what they. <laughs> well, and but there's like, that whole, the spirit of the law thing, you know, yeah. like yeah, they probably at that point, you know, felt like we did. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, for me, like. Actually, my hardest year was sophomore year. And a lot of people talk about sophomore slump and everything. And even my parents were like, you know, this sophomore year might be the hardest or whatever. And for me, it was hard um, because I was a floor chaplain that year. And so as part of that, I felt like I had to obey all the rules. So that right. was the one year I did. Um, and it was really rough um but it was also just concurrent with like a, the the biggest crisis of faith i'd had at that point like at the same time um and that was contributed by a whole bunch of stuff like the political climate there was a strong political climate and you were there too like mm -hmm. you and i and we're also you know arm in arm because we were both <laughs> like liberal at a conservative school right um, and not even all that liberal <laughs> to be honest yeah <laughs> like, no actually when I so I don't remember which one of your first guests who are also students at that school were talking about that like I don't have a lot of memories of college uh, again I don't think it's because I'm I've blocked them out or anything I just don't remember things well so like even you talking about being a chaplain Sophomore year is the year I left and moved back to Arizona for the second half of the year. So I don't remember that year at IWU hardly at all. Um, but I remember when I came back, I was ready to hit the ground running. Um, I think at that point I was 21, maybe. 
Mm-hmm. And I had gone to Vegas for my 21st birthday, like a big F you to that school. Um, you know, partied in Vegas for my 21st and Mexico, actually. But Michelle and I went both places. And <laughs> when I got back on campus, maybe this is junior year. I don't know. But when I got ba- back on campus, I had alcohol in the bottom of my clothes hamper and I brought it into my dorm. Um, we got stuck in a dorm because I made the decision last minute that I was coming back. And that would be the only place that my roommates and I could all fit together. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I don't remember where this was going to be honest. <laughs> political. Yeah. So, right. I, after growing up in Naperville, um, which is a very conservative place, we should say. Yes. That's a good point to make. Uh, politics was not something that was really talked about in my home. I, I know that my parents vote and, uh, like my dad watches CNN constantly, but they never told us who they voted for. And we never had a political discussion ever that I can remember again who knows, maybe we did. And I just don't remember, but my roommate, one of my roommates, um, at Iwu grew up in a very liberal family. And so kind of having it put to terms for the first time that I remembered, um, like, you know, conservative, uh, versus liberal type of thing. I was like, Oh yeah, no, I definitely believe this. And I definitely don't believe that. And so it turns out I was liberal. Um, (laughs) even after growing up in a super, uh, upper middle class, rich white area. Um, I don't know, somehow that's some stuff just didn't line up in my heart or with my understanding of Jesus. So yes, you said we were both somehow liberal and arm in arm and that's my long way of getting there. (laughs) Yeah, no, no. I mean, that's, that's all, that's all good. And we were both charter members of the college Democrats or, um, Mm -hmm. I think we even put like the school name in the, in there just, uh, as another, just like, uh, yeah, just fly, fly in the ointment kind of, kind of move. Um, and yeah, it was, um, it, all those things contributed to a very kind of conflicted sort of college experience. Um, Mm -hmm. I've definitely shared before that, you know, it it was a complicated time, probably more complicated than some other people um, can relate to. But uh, my, I, this imagery that um, I guess uh, Chris Stroop gave was that you're weird everywhere. You feel weird yeah. everywhere. And that really I stuck with me. I liked that a lot. Yeah. So that really <laughs> stuck with me. Um, and that's kind of how I felt sort of during college and after college. experience um what's next for you yeah so i left um oh i almost did it i almost dropped the name Uh i left there (laughs) uh (laughs) and didn't really leave town because i didn't know what i was doing or what i was going to do i had switched my major from uh, music education to communications when i came back from my uh semester in Arizona. And I did that because I just wanted to graduate. Like I, I knew that going back to music ed would, uh, hold me there longer and I didn't want to be held there longer. Um, and so as it is, I did have to do a fifth year because my credits from Arizona state, uh, didn't transfer. So yay. Um, so I was a townie for, (laughs) uh, (laughs) two years or so I substitute taught my roommate, my best friend, um, 
we still lived together in, a, in an apartment in town and she worked for a foster care agency and I substitute taught and at times worked at Walgreens and I had been working there since I was 16. So they just kind of let me come and go as I needed to or wanted to, which was nice. Um, I didn't really do a lot. <laughs> like, I don't know how the bills got paid, come to think of it. Um, but somehow they did and we both contributed. So I must've sub subbed enough. Um, but I had no idea what I wanted to do, uh, with the communications thing. Uh, I told my parents and, and believed it in my heart that my dream was to be the first, uh, female announcer for the Cubs. And yes. <laughs> so lifelong Cubs fan, all of those who have jumped on the bandwagon, like you can <laughs> You can hop back off now. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm that person. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so they like were, you know, really hopeful that that was going to happen. And to be quite honest, if that ever came about, I would probably cry for a week and pee my pants and then start my job <laughs> because I would be so it would be incredible. Um, but let's get back to reality. Yeah. So I didn't know what I was doing and, um, that's kind of what kept me in town was that I didn't know what I was doing. And I think I was kind of scared of the real world. And then somewhere around halfway through that, that I think it must've been 2006 still being in town. I, um, wasn't really going to church, um, went through a, an angry time when my, my mom's father passed away the semester that I lived in Arizona and he had lived with them as well. And he was my favorite person in the world. Um, I think I loved him more than I ever loved anybody. And, uh, he even, he even helped pay for my trip to Italy with the, I went with the honors college there, which I was not at honors college, but <laughs> any, any opportunity to get to, um, Italy. Yeah. Uh, and so I was like really angry at God in that time. And just, uh, I think coming out of that environment at that school, feeling uh, disenfranchised and just like, I wanted to stick it to the man and not be told how to live my life. Um, so partway through that second year living in town, I started to feel called back and like, I had some people speaking truth into my life and, um, you know, I liked not going to church because I liked not having to be committed to a community, um, and like held accountable, I guess. Not that I, I was not living in a way that was displeasing, uh, to God, if you want to use those terms, but I just was kind of complacent, I guess is a good way to say it and just doing life. And, but that wasn't satisfying. And I knew that that's not what God had for me. And um, so a job opportunity came up. My brother-in-law worked with somebody who went to this church out in Plano, Illinois, and it was a small United Methodist church, and they were looking for a youth pastor. And so my brother-in-law um, knew that I was just kind of not doing much <laughs> and wanting to probably move back to Illinois. He... Um, I should add that at that time I was driving to Illinois every weekend because my uh, youngest niece who, um, I mean, oldest niece who turned 12 today right ah. now, that's insane. Um, <laughs> she was live. And so I was there every weekend to be with my niece. Um, so he tells me about this job, gives the guy my number and I get connected with their senior pastor who was also named Christina. And, um, we really, really hit it off and she, they offered me the job and it came with a house. Um, and so I thought, oh, well, now I can move back. And the house was about a mile away from where my sister and brother-in-law and niece lived. So what could be better than that? Um, yeah, so I moved back to Illinois. Um, I guess that was 2006 and worked at that church. And I had no idea what the hell I was doing. Not even a little bit. Like in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, anybody can be a youth pastor. Um, because Becky made it look incredibly easy. It is not incredibly easy, let me tell you that. Um, but also how we had grown up was not working. That model of ministry somehow wasn't working at that time in that particular 
um, country church. So Mm -hmm. that year uh, was really, really hard. And I, I can look back now and say, okay, probably wasn't a total failure, but it was not good. And I, um, I still, I like, I'm friends with some of those kids on Facebook still who are not kids anymore. They're definitely adults. Um, and the, their lives even reflect in in my opinion, maybe I'm really hard on myself, but in my opinion, uh, the lack of a good job, (laughs) like I took them on a mission trip, um, uh, the first year that I lived there and that was pretty life changing for a couple of them. Um, but the fruit of that is far gone and rotted. And so, um, that was a really hard time for me because I wanted it to be Wheatland part two and it wasn't working. And I thought, well, what else can I do? Um, yeah, it was really hard. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I, I can imagine, but, um, I think this is where this impulse you have that I've observed for so long, this impulse that you have to care and to serve can like starts and it still continues now because after that you, you for as hard as you are, I'm sure that you made an impact on these people. I'm positive you did. And then, and then from that you, you, then go to Uganda and you serve there. Um, You continue to serve. Um, Meanwhile, you know, uh, inwardly turning people like me just like are wallowing for (laughs) a few more years. Um, uh, Yeah. Uh, um, But you, you, you take this and you continue on and you go uh, another step. You take another step and you go to Uganda um what what's the connect what's the connector there um uh so towards the end of that first year so i i started working at that church in may of 2007 i guess um in in may march or uh, i'm sorry april or may of 2000 eight <laughs> i'm doing really well uh <laughs> My friend uh, and I decided to go to Panama City Beach. We were going to spring break it up, and um, and his brother came along. And so the three of us drove through the night to Panama City Beach, Florida, and um, like got there probably around 11 a.m. And so we were all exhausted, uh, but we're like, oh, okay, we're only at the beach for like five days, so we have to make the most of it. So instead of going to sleep, we went down to the beach and hung out and like – it was so great, but by about, you know, six or seven o'clock that night, everybody was getting really crabby. And, um, especially, um, my friend and his brother, and of course they're siblings. So they're fighting like siblings. <laughs> and I remember, I remember thinking I am going to kill somebody if, uh, if we don't all calm down or if somebody doesn't go to, so I said, you know, they were like, we're going to take a nap. Um, and I'm like, great, that's awesome. <laughs> I'm going to leave now. So I actually took my Bible and I went down to the beach and there weren't many people on the beach cause it was right around sunset. And I remember sitting there and saying to God, you know, like people do making these demands of God, okay, you need to do something or help me do something because I am failing at this church. And I don't think that's what you want. I don't think that the best is happening here. And that made me feel physically ill because I desperately wanted to change people for Christ the way that I had been changed. I wanted them to have the experiences that we had in youth group. And, um, so I'm sitting there basically crying out to God and I opened my Bible to the Psalms because when you open to the Psalms, you don't have to commit to much. Like you could read a Psalm and then say you read your Bible and be done. Um, because they're, you know, of course, really short, most of them, not all. And (laughs) so I read a Psalm and I couldn't even tell you today which Psalm that was. And then God said, "Uh, no, I 
no, no, I'm not satisfied. And this isn't enough. And so he led me to John 15. I need to kind of preface this by saying I avoided John chapter 15 for a really long time after high school because this stupid little book came out. I can't remember. Oh, Bruce Wilkinson. Am I, I probably shouldn't be naming. I don't know. Um, it's fine. It's a, it's an author. Um, (laughs) right. Yeah. So this book came out called secrets of the, of the vine. And in my mind, it was very much prosperity gospel. And like, if you pray this certain way, then God is going to give you everything that you ever wanted. Genie in a bottle bullshit essentially. And I, so I hated that passage because so many people bought into that. Even adults in our church. Um, I remember the mom of one of our friends, it, like really bought into that. And I was like, this is not how we treat the word of God. And this isn't, God is not a genie in a bottle. And so the point is that I was really not into John 15 because it brought back all of those things that I thought were, were just lies about who God is. Um, so, but I read it, you know, I'm like, fine, whatever, I'll do this. And started reading. And in the first, like, I don't know, 11 verses of John 15, I ha- I was reading the New Living Translation, and it says, remain in me. If you remain in me, I'll remain in you. And remain in me, remain in Like, seriously, seven times or something. And as I'm reading that, I'm like, okay, God, I hear you. Okay, I will continue to follow you, but do something. And he pretty much said, I'm going to ask you to do something big, But I promise that if you trust me, if you follow me and remain in me, I'll remain in you. I was like, okay. So, (laughs) um, like, I believed that and I trusted that and I couldn't get the word remain or abide out of my head. Like, it was stuck there. It's tattooed on my wrist now. Um, But so when I got back to the hotel room, I opened my email and there was an email from somebody we had gone to college with. She was working for a local mission organization and out of nowhere said, Hey, there's some opportunities in Kenya um, and Uganda. And I was like, well, that's a weird, why I haven't spoken to her since our freshman year when we had our little orientation group, like we weren't friends in college. That's a really weird thing. So somehow maybe Facebook in its early stages, maybe she knew I was doing youth ministry or something. And so I emailed her back and I was like, um, no, (laughs) (laughs) just like, no, I have a job right now, but tell me, I don't, at that point, I honestly didn't know where Uganda was on a map. Awesome. Good job, geography. (laughs) Um, so I said, tell me, tell me something about it. And so they have this volunteer program, uh, for, you know, kind of young adult college age uh, people to volunteer their time. And it can be like six weeks to a year long thing. And so I ended up uh, from, from that day on the beach in Florida to the time I landed in Uganda was about six weeks. And I was supposed to raise all this money. And um, what they needed was a teacher at an international school. Um, I was not a certified teacher. I dropped that part of my major, but I was really good at working with kids. And so I was like, yeah, let's do this. Um, But the stressful part was I'm going to have to raise all this money. And then all of a sudden the money started coming in and it wasn't quite enough, but they said, well, come anyway. And um, we'll, you know, see how things are going halfway through the year. So I moved to Uganda and it was one of those where like one day I'm in America and things are going not great. And then I'm in Africa. And how the hell did I get to Africa? And I stepped off the plane and this um, crazy, awesome missionary uh, family greeted me at the airport. They had signs and their kids were wearing like funny face glasses with the mustache and the nose. (laughs) And I was like, oh, my God, what? Why am I here right now? (laughs) But then we drove back to where I was going to be staying and there was a camel on the side of the road walking. And I was like, this is the best choice I've ever made in my life. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So I went to Uganda and I taught at this international school uh, for a year. I taught sixth grade. I did not teach it well. Uh, And I, I, I'm okay to admit that because my students passed and then the next year they passed the next grade. So I couldn't have done too poorly. Um, My, my roommate was a teacher by 
uh, trade, I guess. And she was very helpful. The principal was very gracious and kind of walked me through uh, writing good lesson plans. And I enjoyed some of it. And there were some things I really, really excelled at. And I had really good relationships with my kids. Um, because that's just kind of what I do is I build relationships and love people. And so it was really very difficult. Teaching is no joke. And I would um, lobby my butt off for our teachers to make more money uh, if given. I guess I do have the opportunity. Maybe I need to do that. Uh, but teaching is really hard. So <laughs> I did that and um, led a discipleship group for some Kenyan women. There was a, a university near us that for some reason, a lot of Kenyans came to. So my roommate and I led a discipleship group where we did um, Bible study and worship. And um, then I got connected with this family um, who was not through our organization. They worked with former child soldiers and refugees. Uh, they're called Refuge and Hope International, and they're a phenomenal organization. And in that first three months, um, I met two of their soon-to-be sons who were not um, child soldiers, but they were lost boys, essentially, um, from the uh, war in Sudan. And so the other guys that were around and in the house were former child soldiers. But I got to know them um, and really was... Uh, I mean, your life is altered when you hear people's stories, especially stories like that. But when I encountered uh, these two, the younger boys, they started coming to our international school. They didn't speak great English. And, um, but they're, I, again, it was one of those, I don't even like to use this phrase, but like a, a God type thing, because, um, you know, a few months into that year, the older boy was injured and uh, triggered some very, very serious post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and, um, I, I mean, I could go into all, all that. I don't even know where we're at on time or anything, but, um, uh, so a lot of my time outside of school was spent with this boy who was having flashbacks and who was severely disabled by this disease. Um, he watched, you know, his his family and then his semi adopted family and then people who just took him in. He watched them all die um, in attacks in their villages and uh, so was was triggered and um, so a lot of that first year for me was spent with this young man and his um, his parents who are now his actual parents. They've adopted him. Um, they were busy and working and so as one of the youth people, I I worked. Um, we had youth group through the school as well with the high school kids. Um, they trusted me with him. And, and there were times when it was terrifying because his flashbacks were so real that, that him telling the story made them real for all of us in the room. Uh, and so that changed my life. Like I became the one person for him um, that, that he trusted, that he felt safe with, uh, when he was finally able to come back to school as some of his memories came back and things like that. Um, if he had an episode, they would call me out of my classroom, no matter what I was doing to help bring him back because for some reason he felt safe with me. Um, so I knew that I knew why God, um, brought me to Uganda and, even though my first three months there were like the loneliest three months of my entire life. Um, back then the speed of the internet was like worse than dial up. And so you couldn't video Skype. I don't even think that was a thing. Um, and no joke, it took like five minutes just to load a Facebook page. Uh, so communication was at an all time low for me. And, but God in that time said, I'm enough. And I knew that. And I trusted that because I don't think I would have made it through if God wasn't enough. So, um, yeah, that was my first year in Uganda. When I left there, um, at the end of that school year, I was devastated to have to leave. Although I was thankful to not be teaching anymore. I was so, so sad because I built really strong relationships and really loved my kids and 
really love those Sudanese guys um, and their family uh, mm-hmm. became like my family. Look, another situation where I take on someone else's family as my own. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew the moment I stepped on the plane to go to London and then come here, I'm like, I'm going back. Uh, there's no way I can't go back to America. I can't go back to America because in Uganda, people here really worship. People here really know what it is to need God because they understand the term need versus want. Hmm. And that was like life changing for me because there's a major difference and I haven't seen a lot. There are people in this country who know what it means to need. Um, but it's not prevalent (laughs) as prevalent. (laughs) as prevalent so yeah so uh, how long were you here before you uh, here in the states before you um, went back and did you did you have a different position the second I, I believe you did but I don't remember what it what it was yeah so I was in the states for much longer than I ever wanted to be I was in the states for a year and a half I think something like that um so I've never been a rule follower, uh, in case you missed that. <laughs> and um, I didn't so miss the, it. <laughs> the, mission, <laughs> the mission that I went through also had some strict rules on their volunteers. And um, one of them was no dating. And I had started spending time with somebody um, who was African. And so I got myself in trouble in that way. Um, we were the reality is we were not dating, but just the fact that we were good friends apparently stressed people out. And it, it seemed inappropriate because he was African, a teacher at the school, and I was white. And so I hated that. <laughs> um, so the mission and I uh, were at odds about a few things. And um, they're great, by the way. And I think what they're doing is great. I just don't completely agree with everything, but they're doing some amazing work. Their missionaries are and praise the Lord. So, um, because of that kind of broken relationship with them, I couldn't figure out a way in like, okay, I know I need to go back and I would be okay with working with this organization, but I can't be at that school anymore because I don't want to, I don't want to be at the school anymore. There has to be something else. And so I started talking with um, those who had kind of been over me in Uganda and just saying, here's the thing. I know what I did was wrong in your eyes. Like I understand the rules and I understand that I broke the rules um, and that I was a challenge to you all. But I feel very strongly that I need to be in Uganda. And so I'm wondering Um, if there's anything I can do to come back and not be at the school. Because a lot of their ministries at that time were really focused on the school. And I just knew that I I didn't want to be a part of that unless I was going to be like chaplain or something. I didn't want to teach. So they talked and they had meetings. They had meetings about me (laughs) and um, prayed, I guess, that I would mature or uh, change my heart. I don't really know. Um, and I even reached out to that other, the, the refuge and hope, um, organization and said, could I come through you guys? They were a young organization at the time and unable to, like they were there through a parent organization and then made their own organization out of that. So they didn't have insurance. I mean, they just didn't have at that time, the resources or the time to take on, um, like working on all of my work permits and uh, insurance stuff. So understandably, um, I couldn't go through them, but I could work with them when I came back. And so in my mind, I was going to work for them, but I was just going to go with this other organization because that's how it's the easiest way to get there. Sure. Um, And and people like to give money when you're going with an organization. Like, I'm pretty sure if I would have sent letters and just said, can you give me $20,000? People would be like, what? That's really weird. I'm not giving you my money. So. You know, when you go through a a registered 501c3, like people are more prone to be generous. Um, So actually, our home church gave uh, nearly half of what was necessary for me to return, which was amazing. And um, I ended up going back through that mission organization under with the understanding that I would be working orphan ministry. And uh, so that entailed we had the school out on an island. in Lake Victoria and they were uh, in desperate need of some kind of like, 
like a compassion international type of um, thing going on where the kids needed sponsor sponsorship and they needed somebody to do that. And so that was like my main thing. I did talk to them about the fact that I wanted to be working with Refuge and Hope and just felt very strongly that I wanted to work with the refugees and with the Sudanese guys. Um, and at that time, Refuge and Hope was starting a place called uh, a thing called the Center of Hope where refugees um, would come for school and for life training and um, things like that. And so I wanted so badly to be a part of that because I just felt, I think, more compassion towards that ministry and those people than I have for anyone ever, um, you know, outside of like my family, I guess. So I went back after being home and being uncomfortable being in America, I went back and felt like I was at home. Um, I worked, I taught uh, English as a second language with uh, Refuge and Hope International at their center of hope. And I taught a reading and writing class and something else. Can't remember now. Uh, and then they also asked me to start a weekly Bible study slash worship time. Um, and that was attended mainly by Muslims. Like, it was the weirdest and the coolest thing ever. And <laughs> it sounds like amazing. I, it was amazing. I don't know how to minister. or I didn't know how to minister to Muslims. So I'm like, okay, let's just study the Bible and had to really learn and be taught, I guess I should say, how to do that. And thankfully, uh, the Refuge and Hope um, um, founders had a lot of experience working with that demographic and uh, knew and understood a great deal about Islam that I probably never would have had I not spent time with them. Uh, so we got this going. And then all the while in the background, I'm still a part of this other organization and I'm supposed to be doing X, Y, and Z. I'm supposed to be like getting these websites together um, for this and that and traveling over to Kenya to work with some of our missionaries over there and some of those ministries kind of doing PR stuff, which is how I convinced them I could come back was by using my degree. Um, and <laughs> quite honestly, I never loved that. I wasn't, I don't know. I loved the people I was meeting. I loved, uh, the ministries that the, that the mission was working with, but I really wanted to be with the refugees and I really wanted to be with that ministry. So at a certain point, I really did kind of, uh, not it wasn't missed by my bosses through the mission that I spent most of my time with this other organization. And so there was a lot of uh, dissension there. And, and of course, I'm sure they were like, why the heck did we let this girl come back? But I felt very, very, very drawn to that ministry. And so that's what I poured myself into. And then I, I, I did what they asked me to do, but not to my best ability, which I still regret to this day. Um, so yeah, my second year was incredible. I saw these people um, who I'd never had an interaction with a Somali Muslim in my life, but I saw these people come to Christ and it was the craziest thing and, and awesome. I think really is the only word to describe it because it, it's awe-inspiring. Like these are people whose lives are now in danger because they've converted from Islam to Christianity, not in danger um, from the Ugandan government because it's a free country or religious freedom is, is um, practiced, uh, but because their own family following whatever Islamic law would threaten their lives. I had a girl whose brother... Um, tried to attack her because she was coming to my Bible study. And so we were in a safe compound. He was not allowed in, but he would have killed her if he would have gotten to her. And that was the kind of stuff we were dealing with. I was given the opportunity by the president of my sending organization um, to go to this guest house one day where he, they were in the country visiting, whatever. Um, and there were, there were a couple of women there who were Muslim, but wanted to know Jesus. And they knew that I'd been working with Muslims and also knew that 
men or yeah, men dealing with women was inappropriate. So asked me to go and like got to pray with these women to come to know Christ and minister to them and, um, find Bibles for them in their, in their mother tongue. And like, you want to talk about being on the ground and, um, doing what the Lord is asking you to do, build relationships with people, the end, love people, um, spend time with them, invest in their lives, teach English to them. They, they know that you're different and they want to know why. And, um, so that was Africa and I love it there. And if I had my way, I would probably be back there right now. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but I also recognize that there's important work to be done here. And so that's what I have been doing for the last four and a half years. Yeah. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> that's all I, I don't even <laughs> know how to segue necessarily um, <laughs> because, and this is something that um, I feel very fortunate to talk to people uh, through this show because they, they make me dumbstruck basically <laughs> like that. And I, I, I'm just still absorbing what you shared just then. Um, and I don't necessarily, um, you're you're still um active within ministry and you're still um and I I respect that and I don't necessarily want you to speak to something that, that you might feel you're not prepared or don't want to talk about necessarily in regards to that. But just um in light of all this experience and in light of um well to be very frank, we're recording this the day after Donald Trump was just elected. Um, and so there's definitely a lot of, um, there's a lot of inner reflection that's happening. Um, and that's sort of the, the dark cloud that's, that's hanging over, um, the country right now. And, um, 81% of evangelicals, including, um, and that does include most likely white evangelicals, uh, supported, uh, Trump, um, at the ballot box and throughout his, uh, campaign um and it's sort of emblematic of basically the dark side of evangelicalism in particular uh american christianity overall and um i'm just very curious in light of that and in light of your um you're very sincere and you're very um strong connection to God and to um, the example of Christ and the way you've lived that out through a life of service, how you, how you feel um, and how you sort of reconcile the God that you understand and the God that has pushed you into a relationship with people that are different than you. <laughs> and I'm getting all misty, um, you know, pushing you towards people to love them. And then to see evangelicalism prop up someone like um, someone like Trump, and um, and really to how how do you understand like how how do you begin to comprehend a the relationship with the God that you know and where you stand amongst. Um, your fellow, the people that we would like to call brothers and sisters? Mm -hmm. Um, the short answer is I don't like today. I laid in bed and cried and uh, let that be embarrassing. That's fine. But I have, I have, um, family and I have friends who are LGBTQ, I have, you know, my, outside of my family of origin, I have my African family, and I have my Muslim brothers and sisters. And so my answer is, I, I, I don't, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take it back a step. So I think to give some understanding of where I currently stand, because I didn't agree or seek out, I guess, maybe to um, be a part of the podcast because um, 
because I have this like crazy awesome story about how I want to say F you evangelicals and we say it differently and that's kind of bugs me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but so you're right. I'm still in ministry. Um, I'm an assistant pastor at a local, very, sm- uh, in my opinion, a smaller um, United Methodist church in New Jersey. Um, and I'm not ordained, hence assistant as opposed to associate. Um, so I was hired to do that and also run the youth ministry. And I am um, extremely passionate still to this day about youth ministry and about um, and by the way, I think I do a little bit of a better job than I did at that first church. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but when I came back from Uganda and I had the opportunity to work in a couple of different churches, uh, here, Arizona, and, um, other places, I was offered some positions. Uh, I knew that uh, it was clear as day that God was leading me here. Uh, I don't know of a better way to describe it, so I'm not going to try. Um, but I didn't know why, because if I'm being totally honest, I was pissed at the church in America because, because of what I had experienced in Africa and like, yeah, church services are like sometimes two hours, but sometimes six hours long. And it it's not an inconvenience when it's six hours long because they're going to start a worship set over because somebody just walked in the door late because they want them to experience God. And so, um, like the, the actual desperation and the need that I witnessed, the need for God that I witnessed, the hunger, um, did nothing but motivate me to want to wake this sleeping giant that is the church in America up. Um, I didn't know how I was going to be able to work in a church without getting myself fired <laughs> essentially because because when I got to this church there were um uh arguments about the color of the carpet that they wanted to put in the sanctuary and like people are going to have uh, 10 different committees that's an exaggeration but you know three uh-huh. different committees working on the change of a color of carpet um they're going to argue about money about carpet when there are people in our congregation who are not walking with Christ, but we should probably talk some more about the carpet because that's really important. You know, if it's too cold on a, on a Sunday morning in the sanctuary, people complain. And yet I watched people um, walk into a church barefoot in a ripped, torn up, filthy, um, <laughs> Bulls Dynasty t-shirt in Africa because they just needed God. They just wanted God. But we're going to sit here and we're going to argue about the damn carpet. Like, I had a really hard, I still have a really hard time transitioning back. I've been here for four and a half years. Like, I have some anger issues, I think, with the church and not just the United Methodist Church, um, but again, the greater church in the U.S. And and I think there are, I know there are exceptions to that. Um, I would like to see more exceptions to that. So um, I honestly, Blake, I could talk about that piece for like an hour and I'm not going to because nobody will listen to it. So <laughs> What I am going to say is that um, for as many times as I've been asked in the last couple of years, I ran the church last year because my senior pastor was ill and then passed away. Um, and so I've been asked specifically by the bishop to uh, pursue ordination. And I I can't do that. Like I can't in my right mind, <laughs> I can't in my heart put together how how that would be okay for me. Um, because there are a lot of things that I just can't, um, I can't mesh with, but, uh, so I remain in the church because I believe that, I believe that the gospel has to be spoken. I believe that I have to help, uh, youth and adults alike experience Christ the way that I have. 
or better than I have. I believe at my core that people need Jesus. And however many times I've wanted to walk away from that, I can't do it because of the souls. I think that's why. Because I think I would be uncomfortable um, knowing what I'm walking away from and turning my back on. And that that's that's my family. That's brothers and sisters, literal brothers and sisters who don't know Jesus. And I can't, I'm very uncomfortable with that. Um, so to bring it somehow back around to your question... I don't know how to reconcile this. I'm appalled that people who consider themselves evangelicals would go to the polls and elect a man who is, I'm going to try not to be dramatic, who uh, is one of the least Christ-like people I've ever uh, been aware of in my life. This is a man who has no record of Christianity or evangelicalism. He has, there's no fruit of that in his life. His statements uh, about women, about people with disabilities, people of color, uh, people of different religion, like all of the things that we've watched unfold in front of our faces for the last two years, year and a half, whatever makes me physically ill. Um, And so it's beyond my understanding how people could have let that happen. And I know it's very raw. Like I said, I, I couldn't help but cry today and weep because I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed for my country. I'm embarrassed for the church. I'm super competitive, so that probably plays into it as well. My candidate didn't win. Um, But the fact that our uh, elected president is somebody who my nieces are not going to feel safe with makes me cry. Because they're half black. They're girls. They're not safe. It's not okay. And for people in the church to justify what they've done as okay is shocking to me. Um, I, and I understand that my words are very harsh right now, but again, my emotions are raw. Yeah, no, it's, it. it's a, it's a difficult question. And I think we're, everyone is processing it, whether they were for or against uh, yeah. the, the resulting decision. Um, but yeah, I mean, we were, we were we were torn up too um yeah i mean every the, the truth is everybody knows somebody that is going to to have to reckon with this um so yeah, yeah. and i don't to your earlier point i <clears throat> the show overall is not just about uh, like you said, F you, it's not necessarily about that. It's like, there's something, um, if someone wants to say that they're welcome to, and this is a safe space for them to do that. Um, but it's also just a, a place to, to wrestle. Um, Israel means wrestling with God. Um, so like the idea of wrestling with, <clears throat> with these questions goes back to the very root of, uh, of our faith. Um, or our previous faith, or however you want to, however you want mm-hmm. to phrase it, um, and uh, it it does seem to go against the experiences that that you and and many others have had, um, and I think we just have to sort of wrestle with that. I don't want to, um, I don't necessarily want to end here on a. Uh, on a negative note. <laughs> um I mean <laughs> right it's on. it's very uh it's it's very <clears throat> it's hard to see what's what's coming up and uh and what'll happen next. But uh um 
Yeah, uh, so this let is me, nervous laughter. So let me let me intercede here really quick. <laughs> Please, I I also me. don't yeah I don't want to end on a negative note either. What I do I think my purpose or my message is that um, while I don't agree with much of uh, what is considered to be evangelicalism or whatever evangelicalism <laughs> yeah whatever <laughs> um what i do know about what i do know about god uh and and what i do know about grace is that what we've seen displayed doesn't line up with that um to not love somebody for any reason i don't care what the reason is is not acceptable and does not align with the gospel of jesus christ um to treat people with hate or with even just a little bit of disdain i guess is it doesn't line up with the message of jesus because the jesus i know uh spent time with with people that uh our our president elect would not so um the hope is in that in that map that we talked about earlier that millennials if if the election were left up to millennials uh, it would not have gone the way that it did that's hopeful to me and and it's an opportunity to uh make our voices heard and also to really and truly just love people um i understand why people walk away from the church and it breaks my heart that they've had experiences like they've had. And I've had those experiences, but for some reason have not felt like I, I can walk away just yet. I hope I don't get to that point. Um, but I, I think there can be hope. You know, even as I wanted to respond very strongly this morning and participate in some of the strong emotions that people were um, shouting at one another via social media, I'm also doing my master's work in counseling right now. And so I think it needs to be okay that we're angry and it needs to be okay that we're sitting in this mess right now. (laughs) Like that has to be okay. And people need to accept it and let us do that. Um, And then we're going to move on and we're going to see what happens. But, but ultimately we need to, we need to make our voices heard. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah, and I, I, I agree. This is um, this is just one more opportunity to to love people for real, and yeah, um, yeah. real. Uh, because all this matters. Uh, to kind of, <clears throat> I don't, I don't know whether I'm forcing a light, uh, something light on this or not. But uh, during the Cubs um, World Series run. Anytime someone would get on base late in the game, I would tell Emily, it's just one more chance for a double play. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, that's right. And so now uh, it's a, it's an opportunity to really band together. And um, I think it's going, the hardest thing is that it's going to be a, situation over the next few years and who knows how long after that that um you will have to have both thick skins and tender hearts if we're really going to really going to be able to hear one another um yeah because there was an angry coalition that no one expected to um rise up yesterday and make their voices known um but that doesn't mean that the other side doesn't have legitimacy um and i just hope that the church symbolizes the sort of life that you've led <clears throat> uh, one of service and one of um of love and of hope and uh i appreciate you <clears throat> i'm sorry i appreciate you sharing your story it means a lot and uh i'm so happy that uh we're still connected and um and that we still can uh still talk to one another and still share these things. So I really appreciate you um sharing. I don't know if you, do you have any anywhere that someone can read something you've written or anything like that is that something <laughs> you're doing right now or uh I've not written anything anything uh very well lately. Um f- but well but let me first of all thank you 
<laughs> what a fun thing to be a part of and to listen to. Like I, every episode I've listened to every episode, I'm like a junkie or something. I don't know. <laughs> I walk away from, from each person's story feeling absolutely encouraged, not discouraged. Like, yeah, even if, even when people have had to walk away, I understand it. And, and so thank you for what you're doing because this is, um, a tool that I've used with some of my kids who have walked away because I want them to hear other people's stories and I want them to know that it, it, it's okay and it's going to be okay. So it's an honor to like be a part of this and, um, be able to have my voice heard uh, for whatever it's worth. And also to catch up with you after <laughs> a long time, um, yeah, is a major, great. major bonus. So, um, yeah, I do have a blog again. It's not very good. It's, um, I can't Christina in Uganda. So that's old. Um, <laughs> Christina in Uganda dot blogspot dot com. And it gets updated like twice a year now that I am in grad school and yeah, working all the time. <laughs> You've got but, a lot on um, your plate for sure. Yeah. There are some, some old musings on there. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Well, Christina, thank you so much for, for sharing. I, I really appreciate it. I'm very, I'm very glad you did. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Blake. Yeah.